you. What a blessing to be able to worship in the house of the Lord, to sing together, to be encouraged in each other's presence. And this morning, I want to encourage you as well that this blessing is one that the angels are looking forward to celebrating with us in person, visible scene. I also want to remind you that this afternoon there is the memorial service for the Hobbinicks, uh, Don Hobbinick. And uh, as the one call said, uh, a few of the family members have had a positive COVID test and they are not symptomatic, but they will be attending in mass. So if you're not, if that doesn't work right for you, we understand and they understand. They certainly don't want anybody to feel like they're here out of obligation, but they are going to go forward with the funeral. So may God bless us as we support them. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you walk by our side, that you offer to give us wisdom, that you nerve us with love, that portrays itself in humility and courage. And now I pray, Lord, as we examine our lives, make us willing to let your spirit speak, to renew, to restore, to lead us in the path of righteousness. Bless this opening of your word, I pray, as our hearts are open before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Beginning a series of sermons on the great one of the world. Take your bulletins out if you would. And I want to read this together to you. I was very encouraged earlier in the year when I walked into one of the classrooms of our village, Seventh-day Adventist School, and I found this quote on the bulletin board. I'm coming back to it not casually and not superficially. As a matter of fact, I'm planning to spend the next several Sabbaths looking at what it means and how it impacts us. And I'm hoping that all of us would stop and make serious consideration of how Jesus wants to reveal himself in us for we are living in the age of the great want. Education, page 57. It says, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. Of course, that's used in the larger sense of people. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole, and men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Let's read it together, could we? The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. Take your Bibles this morning and open, if you would, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, I want to look at verse 18. And I want to explain to you that rather than lamenting where we are in society... This sermon and these series of sermons will be a call to recalibrate our role as salt and light in our civic, in our educational, and in our familial places. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. This is the New American Standard Version. It says, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. The New King James Version says where there is no revelation, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law or something very close to that. I want to tie a couple things together right at the very beginning of this message because so much is riding on the church in the chapters that are about to be written. Take your Bible and turn over to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 And I want to bring together the words of Solomon in the Proverbs and the words of Jesus in the signs of the times. 
Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. It says, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. Now, if we combine that with what the, the proverb says in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision or revelation, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. And if we combine that with Matthew chapter 24, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the next verse is important. It says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. From this pulpit, in private dialogue, and certainly at times you yourselves have lamented the state of affairs, not only in this world, but sometimes in this country, and perhaps even in other places, including some of our institutions. What I want you to know as I start this series is that if love is tied to lawful living, and if law and loveful living is tied to revelation, the real issue for the proverb and for us receiving it is whether or not we want revelation from God. In other words, do we want to hear what the law, the writings, and the prophets have to say in our lives? Now, I would contend with you, if you should so desire to contend with me, that it is no accident that we are living in a politically correct age. There's a, a complete understandable reason for it. The reason we are living in an age where truth is defined by the masses, not by the Word of God, is because the prophetic voice of the church has been lost in society. We found ourselves in an age where expediency and pragmatism tagged on to an amazing technological revolution has upended the sources of authority and inspiration in society. In other words, the Bible teaches that you should stand in the, in the presence of a gray-haired man. The Bible teaches that righteous living over a period of time is wisdom to behold and understanding to engage. But our society has gone out of its way to make sure that those that have length of years are somehow written off as irrelevant. And of course, a technological wizardry may not be uh, their gifts, but an understanding of life is. And what I'm suggesting to you in the moment is that there are too many parents who have gotten out of the way of their kids. Let's start where the rubber really meets the road. I'll have plenty to say about other institutions. But the real truth of the matter is too many kids have gotten out, too many parents have gotten out of the way of their children and let their children have what they want. And while we can look at the life of Absalom in last week's sermon, who didn't get the discipline he should have gotten, the Bible records it so, and others, be it Eli's children. The real truth of the matter is society is nothing more than the collecting, the aggregate, the coming together of lots and lots of people whose individual value systems have slowly been warped, twisted, bent. So as I start down a journey going over what it was and what it is that calibrates real leadership, Let's make sure we bring everything into the home first. Then we can take it into the church and the school and the workplace and the marketplace and society at large. But there's a reason we find ourselves where we're at right now. We have abandoned and moved the old boundary markers of morality 
Rebellion and lawlessness are running in the streets, and they've been running in people's hearts for a whole lot longer, and consequently, the thresholds of love are being surrendered, and consequently, the, the strength of character and courage isn't everywhere where we need it to be. And pretty soon, you see a whole society heading headlong towards the cliff like a paranoid and panicked group of American bison. If it's going to change, and in some situations it will not, but if it's going to change, and in some situations it will, it will not change as a matter of accident. And when you read the book of education and you get to page 57, as soon as you read through a list of spiritual integrity, whether it's for a man, a woman, or a child, the next sentence in the book says, but such a character is not a function of accident. So this morning, we really have one or two choices. We either continue to lament but acknowledge our hypocrisy in failing to be the people we're supposed to be to shape the society, starting with the home as it's supposed to be shaped, or we be totally quiet and don't say anything at all and simply accept that our dereliction of duty is a collective and corporate dishonor to God and our fellow citizens and even to ourselves. So, enough of the sorrow over the failure of our society to turn out right, especially if we're all willing for political correctness to be the modus operandi. Now, let me say a word about politics. The pure science of politics, minus the corruption of self, is trying to understand at least in a free society, where morality and the wishes of the masses can be properly linked together. Understanding where power lies and working it for good is a positive outcome of political effort. We use the word politics as if it's always ugly and dirty and wrong, and the truth of the matter is a wise politician if the word can have any good meaning, and it must, is one who understands relationships and the interplay in group process, in the rule of law, and to its effect upon society. Now, if we go to the colloquial or the more common understanding of political correctness, it simply means trying to figure out where everybody's going and be out, act like we actually got out in front of them. Political correctness without moral fortitude is an impossibility. Well, it's a possibility, but it's not correct. It's an oxymoron. But I want everybody to know as we start down this journey, God, by His grace, if you're open to it, is going to speak to you about what He wants from you. Because there is no fix by labeling somebody else as the fixer. Take your Bibles now and turn over to the book of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. There are many people in the Bible that we could look at relative to the concept of not being bought or sold. That is this morning's subject matter. What does it mean to be bought or sold? How does it work? How does it happen? Is it possible that you might have already been bought and you're ready to be sold and you don't even know it? I want to look at the consummate, unbought person in the Scriptures, save Jesus Christ himself. And yes, we could look at Judas and we could look at Balaam and we could look at others who sold themselves. And by the way, you can sell yourself in a lot of ways. Joseph was offered another woman that wasn't his wife. She was not only free, she was pushy about it. But he was not to be bought and sold by his own desires, unregulated by the law of God. It cost him dearly. We look at all the great people through the Scriptures who have stood up for right, whether it be in a personal encounter or whether it be on behalf of the nation. And we find ourselves engaging a man, in this case John the Baptist, who Jesus says is Elijah, if you can accept it. What is it about Elijah that makes him so unique to the Scriptures? Is that Elijah paid 
Perhaps the highest or one of the highest prophetic prices, certainly those who paid with their lives paid higher, but this long drawn out experience of Elijah as the criminal, the most wanted criminal in the nation of Israel, so emotionally worn out that after an amazing victory on Mount Carmel, he can be set to flight by the treacherous words of a treacherous woman, Jezebel. But in the book of Malachi, he tells us that before the great and terrible day of the Lord, he will send the prophet Elijah. Jesus says, John the Baptist is Elijah if you can accept it. And so we have this template of a role fulfilled by other men and women and by other people. And there is no doubt that there will be an Elijah movement before there is a wrapping up of salvation history. And you, my friends, are to play a part in that movement. And so am I. But I want us to stop for a moment and think about being bought and sold, and I want to do it on the fulcrum of the story of the prophet John. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Now in those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make right his pass. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him, and all Judea and all the districts around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, and they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In reading from the book Desire of Ages, the commentator says this on page 178. For a time, the Baptist influence over the nation had been greater than that of its rulers, its priests, or its princes. I want you to think about that. John the Baptist becomes the most influential person in a whole region of the world, inside the church and outside of the church. It's rulers, not just priests and princes, and of course it's people. If he had announced himself as the Messiah and raised a revolt against Rome, priests and people would have flocked to his standard. Every consideration that appeals to the ambition of the world's conquerors, Satan stood ready to urge upon John the Baptist. But with the evidence before him of his power, let's put our arms around that word. But with the evidence before him of his power, he had steadfastly refused the splendid bribe. The attention which was fixed upon him, he directed to another. I want you to know as we go into this series of messages that it's not that somebody needs to offer you money to buy you out. There are all kinds of things that feed a man's ego or a man's insecurity. And by the way, women can be lumped right in there as well. But if there's one thing that is particularly seductive to the experience of an adult male is the idea that he could be significant, that he could be great, that he could, in its better terms, make a difference, in its worst terms, take advantage of his position. John the Baptist was confronted, if this author is right, with a constant and repetitive invitation. He steadfastly refused. That means more than once the splendid bribe. The question that I think we should all ask ourselves is if over the last few years the devil hasn't been holding out some kind of splendid bribe to all of us. That splendid bribe would be such that we just kind of go along with the nullifying and the silencing of the prophetic voice, whether it's from a senior family member, or whether it's from the pulpit, or wherever, wherever it's from. We'll just kind of join in with the mockery and the laughter of the aged 
And of course, eventually it turned to the fathers. And of course, eventually it turned to the church. And we just kind of go along because life is good. And of course, for some, you've been doubly blessed in this society. And I want to say a word relative to those who have found a greater degree of success than most in this free America. Is there no potential for financial remuneration packages that are quite large and quite bountiful to corrupt one's ability to recognize right and wrong and beyond that, to take away courage because the announcing of dissent could mean the loss of those bountiful benefits. When we think about the splendid bribe, it's not so much that we simply lose money. Sometimes we lose favor. I want to talk to all those mothers who sometimes stand up against those fathers who while they have a tendency sometimes to be maybe a bit stronger than they should and they need the mitigating word of a thoughtful feminine voice, and of course the roles could be switched. I'm just speaking gen generally. How many have helped to silence the word of discipline and the action of reproof that needs to flow from a father to a child or a mother to a child? How many have said, for the sake of maintaining the relationship, I won't engage in anything that strains or stresses? Welcome to our politically correct, dysfunctional world, friends. We didn't get here on accident. And of course, it doesn't help when church members can ride to the rescue to deliver Johnny from the oppressive parents. Ellen White calls that false love sentimentalism. And mind you, I recognize, having pastored for the last 30 years, that occasionally there is a dynamic of over-control and oppressive parental function, and occasionally there does need to be some interjection of voice from the outside. So I'm not here to be unwise about how the group can help balance, but lest we fail to see that being bought and sold has a lot to do with a lot more commodities than just money Let's remember that sometimes the main thing we all want is to be liked, and giving that up might be the costliest thing in our whole experience. The splendid bribe. I was talking with a physician this last week, a physician that has made it his life goal to lift up the downtrodden and to minister to the disadvantaged and those that have been discriminated against. He was speaking quite frankly with me which I appreciated. And he was talking about our societal woes. He said to me, Pastor, they can't hurt my bottom line because I'm already at the bottom. And it's true. Instead of cashing in on his wonderful ability to demand a high income, he's instead taken full advantage of the priceless opportunity to take his benefits and see them as indebtedness to a less benefited society around him. But I do want to talk to you for a moment about being bought or sold because I'm quite convinced that there are many in our society who would stand up and speak up if it wasn't the complete undoing of everything about them. In other words, if you are leveraged to the hilt, in other words, if you are in debt, the Bible makes it very clear that the borrower is, what's the word? Slave to the lender. And so it doesn't matter to me if you're at the top of the pack making a huge income. You can spend it faster than you make it, but especially for those health professionals who've been doubly blessed and have taken on probably more than doubly their share of responsibility to get to the place where they can bless, great gratitude for them. But for all of those individuals who see the revenue stream drying up, and that's the decisive decision-making factor, I'm here today in the name of Jesus Christ to lay down a challenge. But for all the rest of us 
who live right out of the outer fringes of what comes in, what does that do to us when we need to really say, you know what, I've appreciated working here, but I can't appreciate it to the point to where I watch this organization run over the rights and the privileges of formerly faithful people. You can have your job back, I'm done. I was reading a letter, an open letter to the truckers. You know those people that have clogged up the downtown of Ottawa and shut down the Ambassador Bridge about three hours from here? Those truckers, those ordinary people who say something's wrong, those truckers, 90% of them fully vaccinated but not willing to watch free societies be encringed upon by fear. Robert Malone said this Thursday. Of course, Robert Malone is one of the co-inventors of the mRNA technology. For the first time, he writes, we can clearly see that they are willing and able to collude with Silicon Valley to weaponize the banking system against us. Taking $10 million from a political fundraising campaign is something that most of us would not have imagined two years ago. Clearly, this has backfired because it exposed to everyone that there is a unilateral coordination between government, the information technology sector, and the banks. Wow, that's a mouthful. And now we have a direct video evidence of this collusion from the infamous Zoom call recording the, documenting the involvement of the government and the mayor of Ottawa. Does anybody recognize that maybe we've come perilously close to the end of a free society because political correct operatives have been guiding us away from moral imperatives and we're in a position where it might look more like a house of cards than it ever looked before and implosion is a word that you might be hearing without hearing because you're hearing on both sides of the political perspective the end of democracy. Think about it. Writing in the Fifth Testimony, the author would say this, some men have no firmness of character. They're like a ball of putty that can be pressed into any conceivable image. This weakness, this indecision and inefficiency must be overcome. Okay, so let's hit the pause button. If any of us listening right now or any of us speaking right now can stop and say, you know what, weakness, indecision, and inefficiency have somehow overrun my better sense of judgment and the convictions of the Holy Spirit, I have good news for you, friends. When this person writes it must be overcome, that means it can be overcome. You've been weak. You've always told that child the things that child wanted to hear. You're not doing that child a favor. You've been afraid and never told your boss in private with some dignity and respect that he's warring against or she's warring against herself by some of her actions. You never really acted on that clear, that clarion call to put your face into the wind and respectfully say, I'm sorry, like Norman Rockwell's painting of the four freedoms, the freedom of speech, to see that man with soiled hands holding his hat on the back of a pew. Enough people fail to speak and pretty soon you have institutionalized silence and criminalized dissent. Now, I would never, in the name of page 57 of education, seek to somehow sanctify rebellion. So I cannot speak to a people but think that I'm speaking to men and women who desire to have purity of heart and true humility of person. But my larger concern today is when individuals, be they young or old, fail to live out the convictions and fail to recognize the power of the Holy Spirit saying, everybody's going that way, but you should go this way. Everybody's saying this, but you should say that. Everybody's saying nothing, but you should say something.
This weakness, this indecision, and this inefficiency must be overcome. And then she goes on to write, there is an indomitableness, that means unconquerableness, about true Christian character which cannot be molded or subdued by adverse circumstances. That is good news. In other words, no matter what's going on around you, you can live a life where you still honor God and can respect yourself. That, my friends, is a big, big deal. Adverse circumstance does not make the man. The man changes the adverse circumstance. This is the message of the book, Education. And the last sentence, men must have moral backbone. And integrity, that's a big word, which cannot be flattered, bribed, or terrified. Satan is slick, and he understands the leaky vessel that we human beings are, and that for all of the assurance that others may give us, and for all the successes we may have, there is still something about us that doubts ourselves. This is humanity one-on-one. -on -one. And this is why it matters so much that we have healthy families and church families where we can actually encourage in a way that doesn't flatter. We can edify as Mervyn prayed in his prayer. Edification is the proper building up of someone, but when you are being flattered, there is a dastardly deed enacting. The devil comes along and he affirms us in ways that don't honor God and don't remind us of our gifts and our roots. But first he flatters. I want to go back to Joseph and Potiphar's wife. You don't think that all of a sudden she walked into the living room with all of the slaves gone and for the very first time communicated that she thought he was a good-looking man. You don't think that there wasn't the subtle relational dynamics of communicating flattery that went on. And of course, the Bible doesn't tell us all kinds of details like how she presented herself that day. She was alluring him in. Flattery didn't work. Yes, he was a handsome man, and he was a man of great character. He was, he was respectable on every level. But that didn't turn him from fidelity to Potiphar or to God. Then we go to a more direct stage of compromise. In this case, seduction, bribery, these things happen in financial arenas as well, and they happen in educational arenas as well. Sometimes we're trading bodily favors. That's what is Joseph and Potiphar's wife's dynamic. Sometimes we're trading position and status. Sometimes we're trading money. Sometimes we're just trading security. And in some cases, even worse, sometimes just life's basic needs. When he refused, she brought out the wicked stick and cried foul. And now Joseph had reason to be terrified because she was alleging violation under Potiphar's own roof. The devil's tactics have never changed because this order of events determines, it's determined by the character of the person he's engaging with, and some are simply picked off with flattery. You don't think people didn't tell John the Baptist what a fantastic preacher he was? Look at all the people coming to listen to you. You don't think at some level little messages of, hey, come on over and be one of us. Ever made it from 
Jerusalem down to the banks of the Jordan, not far from Jericho. You don't think that the devil wasn't there seeking to allure him away from this peculiar call to preach repentance? And finally, you find him in a jail. You find him in a prison. And as the days wear on, you realize that the battle with terror is growing. This man open to the out of doors, living life with the freedom of God's creation, is now confined in a deep, dark, dank place. And Jesus is not coming to deliver him. And the days are ticking by, flattered, bribed, and terrified. We must place ourselves in an experience with Christ where no man's opinion or no woman's opinion matters more than that of Jesus. To where we are willing to confess him before men, so as Jesus said, he will confess him confess us before the angels. And of course, the book of Revelation picks this up as well, that we will have our names confessed before God by Jesus as friends. When we think about the life of John the Baptist and we look at the story of a man who couldn't be flattered, bribed, or terrified, we realize that what the spirit of prophecy says of him is true. He had often knelt before the king of kings. He had bowed low before the king of kings so he could stand fearless and erect before earthly monarchs. Stick in there, earthly bosses. Stick in there, er, uh, earthly family members. Stick in there, earthly church members. Whatever it might be. In 1930, Percy T. McGann wrote a letter to W.A. Spicer. He said, I often think of the times when my first wife died in Bering Springs in 1904. W.K. Kellogg came to me and begged me. Now, John Harvey built the institution that burned and made us famous for our health work and actually was a big part of the health food discovery of Kellogg's cornflakes. And every time you pick a box of Kellogg's off the shelf, you think Seventh-day Adventism, which is why our role should be somewhat different than it is in the moment. And he begged me, this is WK, this is the brother of John Harvey. This is the man who was still alive when HMS Richards was preaching, and he would show up at the airport in his black limousine to pick up HMS Richard Sr. I mean, the history's not that long ago. And W.K. begged me. You know how flattering that is? Principal slash co-founder, president of Emmanuel Missionary College, being approached by breakfast food mogul and being begged to quit work and join him in the cornflakes company which was at that moment in the process of organization, he offered me a block of stock, $10,000 worth at par value. He wanted me to take charge of the stock sales and offered me a commission on all that was sold with a permanent place in the company when this work was done. $10,000, he writes, of stock would be worth, this is in the 1930s, somewhere in the neighborhood of a million dollars. And of course, trading on that, I could have made it probably three or four million. The offer, in a way, was tempting. But I remember well spending the greater part of a night under a maple tree at Old Berrien, then in the process of its own birth. Now, I want to remind you, friends, his wife has just died. He's not particularly appreciated by some in the community and some of his co-workers at the nascent, the, the new birthed Emmanuel Missionary College. He said, I remember spending the better part of a night talking the whole thing over with the master. And as the morning light broke, I had decided that in spite of all the difficulties, and of course he doesn't say, all the grief, that I must stick to this message 
and give whatever time and talent that I had to the making of Adventists rather than the making of cornflakes. Not flattered, not bribed, not terrified, not terribly appreciated when he left Bering Springs either to go start Madison College. No, the devil finds you in some of your most compromised moments. The devil finds you in some of your most vulnerable moments. I can remember once getting a phone call. God has been very good to me. Almost every invitation that's come my way to go do something bigger and better has come while life is going very well for me. But I do remember one time that a conference president called me when I was discouraged. And I made a mistake. I said, yes, I'll come look at that job. The phone was hung up. And probably about the moment that either I folded it closed or hit the red button, it's almost like the Holy Spirit said to me, who gave you permission to do that? That conference president had listened to me. He was and is someone that I look up to. And I went home and told my wife, and in my quiet moments, all I heard in my head was, you're not supposed to go there. And now all I can hear as I'm thinking my thoughts sometimes out loud is, maybe not out loud, but at least loudly in my mind, this is going to be embarrassing, but I think I need to call them up and tell them I can't come. I wrestled with it for a day or two. And finally, I was glad that one person in the administration had worked with me somewhere else, and I thought that'll be the least embarrassing person to tell them I'm backing out of the interview. But I'll tell you what, when I punched his number into my phone and I hit the little green button to send it, when I finally explained to him that I just don't have any peace, I can't do this, it was as if a thousand tons rolled off of me and I was happy again even though I had to deal with the problems that were all around me where I was. You can't fight a two-fronted battle and be this kind of person. Listen to me. Ellen White will tell us that true religion is sincerity itself. Next week's subject matter will be on men who are true and honest in their inmost souls. When you don't live in full surrender to Jesus Christ, you can't put your face into the wind. When you're compromised in your own soul, you can't stand up and endure the ill favor of the masses. To be the kind of person that she's writing about, to live the kind of life that we're called to live, you have to have nothing between you and God he can't be wrestling with you while you think you're supposed to wrestle with somebody or something else. It's not a two-fronted battle. And the other good news is this, that when you feel weak and everything's okay between you and Jesus, your heart is surrendered. You need to know when you stand up against the Goliath, Jesus stands by your side. And you don't know who's going to turn the tide of the battle. You may look like you're fresh roadkill on the march of iniquity under the bus of wrongdoing. Jesus didn't call any of us to be successful in the dynamics of the world's measure of success, but he did call us to walk in the narrow path. In the first service, I began with the story of Stephen. You know, Stephen was at the real end of the 490 years of Daniel chapter 9. God had given the nation of Israel a 490-year probationary period. The marriage was bad. And so going all the way back to 457 B.C. in the prophetic voice, going all the way back to Daniel, who would announce its beginning, Seventy weeks of years are determined upon your people. Now, for those of you who haven't read it before, aren't comfortable with it, you need to understand that when they took the life of their God on the cross, and that 490 years came to an end, that was a divorce. Not my words. You can read it in the writings of Ellen White. It wasn't that the nation of Israel was no longer dealing with what we'll call the residual blessings of previous days, and it wasn't they were beyond the reach of encountering a salvation experience, but the special relationship was done. 
Stephen had the unfortunate or great privilege, however you might look at it, of being the last prophetic voice to see if they had changed their mind. And when he stands up before them in the Sanhedrin that day, there is a young lawyer, maybe one of the most contentious voices of the up-and-coming Sanhedrin stars. His name is Saul. Stephen takes them on a journey showing that they've refused to surrender. And when he finally gets to that moment in time where he calls them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart, just like your fathers, that's it. And it's like they spring out of their seats and they drag him outside and they begin the gruesome brutalizing of a human being with rocks big enough to break bones and lacerate flesh. And while he is being taken out, he looks up into heaven and he declares that he has spoken on behalf of God and he asks God not to hold this against them. It's over, except for one thing. (laughs) That young lawyer can't shake him. Stephen's voice is in his head every day and every night. And he doubles down on the the perversity of his inner person wrapped around a noble cause. You know, in the nation of Israel, there was this Phineas experience and this Phineas honor. You know, Phineas was the one that stayed the plague when the Midianite women came into the camp. And Saul is acting out of this Phineas complex and he's out taking the lives of men and women. But every night when he goes to bed, the Holy Spirit is answering Stephen's prayer. And God is reaching into the heart of hatred to resurrect love and to redirect a man. You know, Paul, as his name came to be called, was once in prison in Antioch. And with a bribe, he could have got out. But he didn't do it. Because he was there for the sake of the gospel. And its exoneration was salvation in theory, if not practice, for all that heard him. Where are you, friend? Are you willing to walk in the path of Jesus? (laughs) I've told the story before, but I'm going to tell it again. I was 21 years old. I was poor enough to get asked to leave Andrews University. I drove a junky old AMC car, purple and white, with the back corner bashed in, holes in the floor. I was in love, and I made the mistake of letting my wife-to-be give me directions to go somewhere. She had never been before, or she had been, but hadn't remembered, and she is not a natural GPS. So now I know exactly where it happens. I drive by it on the interstate some days and I I look at it and I think about it, but I got on the interstate on old M131, which is now M139. From there I got on the interstate and I drove past the Napier exit. I didn't know then and I didn't have a phone to tell me that there were no exits to Empire Avenue where my uncle lived, her uncle. It was May because we had taken our test and it was time to go home and she wanted to store some of her stuff at his body, his uncle's body shop. And I still kind of remember going past that exit and her saying, no, I don't think it's that one. And of course, you know, 196 comes off Interstate 94, and then you go several miles before you get to another interstate. And I decided to do worse than what the sign says not to do. The sign tells you you're not supposed to turn around in those little bridges between the interstate. I decided I wasn't going to wait for one, and so I pulled my car down into the, I like to call it tundra, It certainly wasn't permafrost. 
And as I drove my car down into the ravine that separated the westbound lanes of 94 from the eastbound, my front wheels rolled through the bottom of the ditch and my back wheels stopped rather abruptly and I was stuck. And as many times as I changed it from first gear to reverse, nothing happened. I suggested to her that she get in the car and drive it. By the way, teach all your kids how to drive a stick shift. She sat there and she could do it. She had learned. Pretty soon, a, a guy driving a glass van, you know, where they take the sheets of glass and deliver them places, pulls up. He tries to help me get out. And pretty soon, uh, we were covered in mud and a state trooper pulled up. And that glass guy decided that was his cue to get up. He's moving on. But as he walked away, he said, tell him you were run off the road. I didn't have money for a ticket. I didn't have money for a tow truck. I probably barely had enough money to drive home. State trooper walks up. I have an instant to make a decision. But I didn't need an instant. <laughs> My mama taught me to tell the truth, and I did. Well, I don't know what he did, but for those of you that have heard the story before, you know that before I left that day, five state troopers were there, and I think he might have gotten on his radio and said, hey, guys, come stop and see this young college kid that actually made a big mistake and told me the truth. There are five state troopers sitting on each side of the road I told them where I was trying to go. They asked me if he had a tow truck. I didn't realize it was illegal for my uncle to come without a tow truck. Not just any old buddy can be yanking you out of the grass. Now, of course, in times of duress, when there's too many in the grass and the snow is falling and the roads are slick, I'm sure it happens. But in this situation, my uncle should not have been allowed to come pull me out. Slowly, every one of the police cars walked away. I don't even think the state trooper who was the leading officer even said anything to me. The sad part of the story is that about a thousand feet down the road was one of those natural land bridges with a sign. If I would have just gone a little farther, I could have avoided all of this. So the next time you're on your way up to Grand Rapids and you're about to get on 196, look to your left. The ruts aren't there. But what if I would have rutted my own heart and for the sake of a few hundred dollars of fines said, somebody ran me off the road? He couldn't have proved any different. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or be lied about and don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your masters, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you've, you gave your life for broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it in one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone, and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue and walk with kings and not lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything in it. And what is more, you'll be a man, my son. We have a crisis. It's not a crisis of political correctness. It's an absence of manhood. We've been victimized by playboy invitations and pursuits of pleasure. We've kind of gone along. 
And in moments when we realize we're going the wrong way, it's made it a little hard to stand up. Not bought, not sold. And by the way, if you're a denominational employee listening to me here today, you don't get any more money with your promotion. Oh, you might get 1% more. But if for the sake of affirmation from the organization, you compromise yourself, just remember this, you're compromised wherever you go until you make it right. We were told by Jeremiah that God would give us pastors after his own heart. Read the book. (laughs) I read a good portion of it last night. If there's one ministry I wouldn't want, it's the ministry of Jeremiah. (laughs) My guess is that's the ministry that all of you are being called to. And I'm with you. Is he only the only true voice? No, there was Ebed Melech, <laughs> the Ethiopian eunuch who went to the king and said, King, you should not have let those men throw him in the pit. You go, Ebed Melech, you're my kind of guy. Brother, you're gonna be faithful? I'm calling you to turn. I'm calling you to be a man of integrity. I'm calling you to be true to duty as the needle of the pole, to stand for the right though the heavens fall, that don't be afraid to call sin by its right name. I'm calling you today to not be bought or sold. And I'm calling you ladies to the same thing. Jesus is calling you. Walk with him and be faithful. And let love grow and courage with it. Amen.